All right. Let's see. We don't have any attendees and we don't have minute, a minute recorder. Wow. We're uh, working under a full moon or something? I think it's that February is so short that it feels like we just did this. I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Oh, now we have an attendee. Is that? That's our minutes recorder. Okay. Um, should we? What? I don't know what to do when we don't have quorum. We, it's up to you. We can go ahead and get started. We would avoid any topics that would require any votes. Um, Michael should be here. The other Michael. Oh, there's Jose. There you go. Quorum. Okay. Now we have quorum. All right. Jose, you saved the day. We didn't have quorum until you got here. Sorry, I'm late. Oh, it's okay. You're barely late. Um, okay, well, we can get started. Um, agenda and materials review. The first thing that I want to add to the agenda is I'm hoping that, well, we can decide. Um, there are only four of us here tonight right now, but we do need to talk about um, boards and commission liaisons. We need to, to elect or appoint new liaisons. So I don't know if we want to do that when we don't have everybody present. But if we decide to do that, then we need to add that to the agenda. So any thoughts on that? Well, let's just drop it in after the training discussion, and then we'll see who's here. OK. All right. So I move that we amend the agenda to add a 5A, or a point between 5 and 6, to talk about boards and commissions and possible election. Second. All right, it is approved. Ah, my pen doesn't work. So the one I'm looking at actually has that at exactly that time, Bernadette. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop that into the chat or something. Okay. I wonder, that's funny. Okay, the agenda that I have doesn't have that on there. So we will just go with it at that time. And my pen still doesn't work. I need to go grab a pen. Okay, well, as long as we're waiting for a pen. Um, hey, Leah, at some point, can you make sure that we all, maybe an email goes out? Since we've been remote for so long, um, I know when we're in person and we have paper documents, we have to leave everything there. Um, and all of my notes are always taken on the agenda itself. Um, but I know sometimes I'm also taking notes on a tablet. So I think we just need some kind of direction with regards to what we can and can't shred ourselves, um, what needs to be turned in. So at some point in time, maybe you can address that. I can do that now if you like. Okay, I just didn't know with a few people out that might also need to hear about it. So I can circle back with folks um, who aren't here, but um, whoa, something just went over all of your faces. This is going so smoothly tonight, guys. Good thing we have no attendees. Right. For minutes so um, when you take notes on uh, items for a public meeting that is considered public record, that is something that our office needs to retain. So when you write down notes on the cases or you write down notes during the meetings, those are things that we will retain for you. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, the easiest method to do that is probably to scan them and then send them to Vicki. Um, so as you say, Bernadette, when we're in person, we will just pick up your papers at the end of the meeting, and put them in a box and store them in, in accordance with public records storage guidelines. Um, but for now, if you want to scan them and then send them to us, that'd be great. Could we also drop them in the drop slot at the office? Sure. Nobody's there. I'm there. Rob's there. Lindsay's there. Sometimes you're not. I don't know. That is true. So today I was there. OK. That's a good question, Bernadette. I've been wondering it, but I haven't asked. Um, okay, so we are talking about agenda and material materials review. We added a part after the training to elect new board liaisons. Is there anything else we want to add or adjust with the agenda? Um, 
Did we just lose our trainer? I think so. Um, okay, so then we can go ahead and move on. Um, the minutes approval, are there any adjustments we need to make to the minutes from February's meeting? I move that we accept the minutes as presented. Second. All right, so our minutes have been approved. Um, let's go ahead and start with the comments from board members and commission liaisons. So any comments you have about anything, plus if you're the liaison, this would be the time to share. Um, I'm gonna write down an order. I will go last this time. I don't know, I'll go first. I don't have anything to say, except I am curious about um, if we have many applicants for the board. Have you heard about that? Is that ha that's happening, right? Applications have not opened yet. I believe they are supposed to open by the end of the week. Okay, so we can still encourage people to apply. Please do, we'll come back to that. Um, there are just four of us right now, yes. Okay, so Michael, can we hear from you next and then I'll put our order in the chat. Sure, um, I do not have any uh, comments. Oh. I saw Burnett or um, Leia's hand go up. Was that a? I was just saying we have five. That's for me. It's a real bad way of saying five. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. Please go ahead. Okay. I don't have anything. I'm a little discombobulated this uh, today. I had computer issues. Uh, Jose. Um, you know, I haven't heard anything from the Human Rights Commission. I've reached out via email um, twice and. I will do so again, but I have yet to hear anything. Um, I assume that they're meeting, right, Leo? I assume so also. Um, so Fabio is the staff person over there to check in with, and then we were assigned to HRC liaisons who I haven't seen here either. So, um, ooh, da, da, da. Jose, why don't you, if you send me an email, um, sort of checking in on that, then I'll remember <laughs> to check in with Fabio and try to get you guys connected. Great, I'll totally do that, thank you. All right, Bernadette and then Alan. Um, I don't have anything other than, I appreciate the follow-up with regards to the, um, you know, what we're supposed to do with notes. Um, I like that we can get in and see all of this um, online. Um, it's sometimes easier. I mean, certainly for the videos and that kind of stuff, it's a little more um, troublesome to like read reports on there because it's harder to make notes and highlight things. Um, you know, but when there's only reports, um, when there's police reports and stuff like that, um, I hope that we will get to go back to um, paper copies at some point in time. Thanks. Uh, good evening. Um, uh, once again, like we weren't noticed in the paper, like I don't want to be the pet peeve. And I, I thought in the past, like before I was on this board that I would see it. So it's just kind of, you know, something to whoever's screen that's supposed to be on. Um, and then I'm looking forward, like when we're back in person to a I think Bernadette's question around handling paperwork is when there are some new members, I think there's just speaking about some new members perhaps coming on board and that we have some kind of process meeting just, uh, you know, there are a lot of things, you know, you know, kind of a quarter into it, you know, four or five meetings into it that um, we as a group have never kind of discussed and there's a lot of um, it just kind of happens and I'm looking forward to, you know, hopefully in the coming months to meet in person and maybe devote some time to, to uh, um, process and work and goals and what, you know, what's the point. So thank you. And Alan, Vicki Vicky and I can check on that. We've been getting our notices in to the proper person at the city. So I'm not sure what's going on there. Yeah. So not we'll, a criticism. Not a no, criticism. it's important. It's really important. So we'll we'll follow up on that. Um, thank you. 
Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in and add that <clears throat> I did bring up the question about the, uh, the issue of the courtesy policy to um, at the police uh, police commission meeting last month, and it was received. Uh, the chief said it'd be an easy fix, and so they will address that. That was the adding of um, disability status to the list of things that, that people shouldn't be uh, officers shouldn't be disparaging about. And I'll just also add right now that I'm not going to be continuing on the the CRB and the police commission after the end of my term this year. So I'll miss you all. Michael, I was about to send you a really begging email, and I still might, just so you know. <laughs> That's fine. All right. Um, well, yeah. OK, uh, public comment. We have no public, unless our minutes taker wants to comment, which let's give them a moment. I don't see a hand. Um, so no public comment, and I think that moves us to the training topic. Leah, could you introduce us? Sure. So Michael Clues, there he is, is the president. Hi, he's president of the Eugene Police Employees Association, which is the union that represents uh, line officers at EPD. Um, you guys have heard his voice several times in the recordings, <laughs> so we thought... <laughs> Be helpful to have him come and talk a little more about um, just what EPA's role is in this process and um, how we work together to and what our I guess how we come together to, to work together <laughs> and get through these. <laughs> but Michael, why don't you go ahead since I'm obviously stumbling over words right now? Well, I'd be more than happy. Thank you for the opportunity to bring in to have me come in here and talk. Um, before we start, I want, to make, I want to make sure a couple of things are very clear here. I can't see the overall panel. My wife is in school right now, so I'm on my phone. So if you have any questions, please just speak up. It's just going to be easier that way. Number two, um, Haley, what date is today? It's March the 8th, Michael. It's, it's March the 8th. Is that, a, is that a special day? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I hear oh that it's a special day. It's International no, it's Women's not. Day. It's International it is Women's International Day. Women's Day. What else is today? Leah, what else is today? I'm sorry. Does anybody else know? It's, it is it's, my birthday. It's, yeah, it's, it's your birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> there we go. So we can, we, we can say at the end here. So watch. I'm representing <laughs> you and your best. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So jokes aside, um, my, my, my role as the president of the Eugene Police Employees Association is to make sure that the basically the contract and labor law are followed throughout not just um, IAs, but also throughout the rest of the contract that we have with the city. And it, it actually is a very somewhat neutral position because the whole point is, is that None of my members, including myself, want to work with people that shouldn't be doing the job. And we represent more than just the line officers. We also represent dispatch, comm center, FEU, animal control, and I mean, anybody that is not a supervisor. And we just make sure that the city actually does their part. And that's really the biggest part in our, in our whole thing. Um, I know you guys don't see the end results. But the truth is, I would venture to guess 95% of the time, if not more, we accept what the ultimate resolution of the, of the outcome is, because the city has done a really good job of making sure that they present their case fairly, um, evenly, and appropriately. And then we have absolutely nothing to stand on. And that's really how we approach the whole thing. Um, we work very collaboratively with everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have a dry throat issue. I don't know what's going on. So if I start coughing, I apologize up front. Um, to again, to make sure that everything is done on the up and up. Um, we have a good working relationship with IA. We have a good working relationship with the auditor's office. And, you know, yeah, you hear my voice occasionally, but that's mainly to ask for some clarifying questions, making sure that all sides are heard. So that's really a very brief overview 
Um, the only thing additional to there is, is that my e-board is uh, comprised of a total of seven folks. I have myself, Pat Willis, who is my vice president. You guys hear his voice occasionally. Scott Dillon is my uh, treasurer secretary. Uh, Sean Kelly is actually uh, Sean Kelly is my treasurer secretary. Um, Scott Dillon is my legislative chair. Um, you have Jacob Nicholson from the Com Center, who is my second vice president. Navasha Tester, who is a member at large, as is Carolyn Demi Kronberger, who works in records. So at this point, it's easier to just kind of do a little Q and A than really me blabbing on because there just isn't a heck of a lot to talk about more. Oh, Michael, I have one. I should have led with this. How long have you been at EPD and how long have you been a part of EPA uh, executive governing structure stuff? Fair enough. Um, I've been with EP, I've been with EPD uh, a little over 20 years now. I have been on the e-board in various um, positions since 2000 and I think it's 14. I think I've been president since 2016. And as such, I've held a variety of different roles within EPD itself. Um, patrol has been my main, my main focus, um, but I'm also a background investigator as well as a major collision investigator. So if you have a really, really bad day or your last day and it involves in the car, I'm the one that uses math and physics to put it all back together to tell you kind of what happened. <clears throat> I'm gonna ask a question. Well, first I'm gonna start with a comment. Um, I appreciate that the, that you said clarifying questions are what you're there for. Um, and I appreciate that all of the cases that you've been involved in, I've never heard anything that didn't sound like a clarifying question. Um, I know on my first round on the board, there were a couple of officers that were involved in the interview process on behalf of the union that started asking questions that seemed to be more defensive of the officer rather than clarifying. Um, and I appreciate that that has seemingly gone away and it's now just clarifying questions. Um, I wonder, do you ever get any feedback from officers on what they think of this process, um, whether they whether they ever check out what we're doing, whether they have any, any thoughts about our discussions getting back to them that they think are appropriate, inappropriate, helpful, not helpful, um, because it would be helpful for us to know kind of what they're thinking after the fact. So we know if what we're doing is actually helpful um, because we can talk to the community and get their side and say, you know, what did you think of our discussion? But kind of knowing what police officers think of our discussion, I think is also equally important. Let me ask you a clarifying question here. Um, that's kind of a pun, no. But uh, are you talking about CRB specifically? Not just the whole IA process? Are you talking about yeah, the, the CRB portion specifically or the whole thing? Because uh, there, there are two different answers there. I guess specifically for the CRB, but I do also wonder what they think of the IA process as well. So the, it's so it's time. interesting. <clears throat> so it's interesting. The, the, the overall, I'll start with the overall. The overall process is very stressful for them. They, they, especially starting out when you first get noticed that there's an allegation of misconduct, whatever the allegation may be, it's very stressful. And it kind of ebbs and flows um, in that, it becomes more stressful the closer you get to the actual IA interview. And then my experience is that once the IA interview is over with, they relax quite a bit. They, 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 they've had their say. They've had, they, they've had their ability to say what they needed to say, and they feel a little more at ease. Then the anxiety wraps up a little bit more when it's time for the adjudication, when the actual adjudication memo comes out and they see if something is sustained or not sustained or whatever terminology is used. Um, and it, let's say that it's one or some are sustained and then it kind of, it ramps down a little bit after they get that first memo, but then it ramps back up when they get the corrective action memo. Um, with all that said, I will tell you that I think the process that we have while long tedious is probably one of the best processes that it exists. The, I've gone to my fair share of trainings, and I think at the end of the day, people want the kind of process that we have. Can it be, can it be um, fine-tuned a little bit here and there? Absolutely. Who, but what can't, right? I mean, 
everything everything can be fine tuned here and there. But I think what ultimately what the, what the beauty of this process is is that it is very fair. It has a lot of eyes on it, and it's very comprehensive. So you're going to get an even equal application of corrective action across the board to no matter who is in the hopper. And I think that should be our all, that should be all of our goals. And I think this this piece including the piece of the CRB does exactly that. I mean, you guys are a vital uh, piece of a check and balance to ensure that the auditor does their job in the middle of the IA process. So specifically, do our officers watch this? I'll be honest with you. Once it's done, they want, they want it to be done. They don't want to have to relive the whole thing over again. They're the, like I said, it's, it's a long, tedious process, and they... Are okay with moving on at that point. Thank you. I appreciate that. It was helpful. I am that good. I have taught you guys everything that you guys wanted to know in five minutes or less. Okay. If I get paid by the hour, I would I would not be making any money right now. <laughs> I just. Uh, Oh, Alan, sorry, Alan, Michael. Michael, go ahead, go ahead. No, you, no I have nothing. Ahead. First, go ahead. Um, well, thank you, uh, uh, officer, I appreciate it. I, I just, my only comment is, is uh, it's refreshing to hear the attitude of the union and that uh, from a historical perspective, that was not always the case and it's not ancient history, but it's long enough ago. And uh, I just, um, uh, um, it's nice to hear the, uh, the attitude you express as what you take into this process. So thank you for sharing. Not a problem. I hope that you, uh, I hope you guys, you guys see that what I'm saying is not just lip service. It's actually how I approach these things from, from the very get go, because I think it is important. And apparently there's another Michael. Excellent name. I promise yes. you I won't forget it. You stole my line. I was going to tell you what a great name you had. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm, I'm jealous of your hair I, I don't have any left so I mean uh, so thank you again for, for making the time to be with us and um, I just wanted to, to so I was a former I used to be a union officer um, for for my um, and my previous employer and so I, I have some understanding although obviously for I'm a professor so the the kinds of issues that come up are different um, certainly than for, for police unions. But I'm curious, like, you know, the, the process that, w that the city went through with the, um, the ad hoc committee, uh, was that last year or the year before? It was the year before. Um, and is now sort of like uh, dealing with, with the recommendations that came out of that. In that process, I know that there were a lot of uh, requests from community members for changes to the police contract. And obviously, that's like a, um, a, a matter for, for collective bargaining, and that happens in, in the, the, the bargaining room. Um, but I'm curious, like, do you have a sense for things that you would like to go into the next round of bargaining um, and approach differently? Are there, are there things that, that uh, right, without uh, revealing any secrets that you have going into the negotiations. Um, are, are there, are, is there a wish list for you for changes to the contract um, at this time? There's always changes or wish list for contract. Um, you're putting me in a little bit of a bind because I, 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 I want to answer your question, but the truth is I, I really just can't right now. Um, that's something once, bargaining is over with, I'd be happy to have that conversation again and tell you what we would have liked to have seen. But it's hard, it's, it's hard to answer that because, I mean, sometimes you have to keep your, you know, cards close to your vest. And since this is recorded, anybody can review it later on. So um, I hope you don't take this respect if I decline to kind of answer that one specifically at this particular moment. But there are certainly things that we would like to see change as it relates to you know, as it relates to specifically, say, grievances or um, as it relates to the, 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 the auditor process, I, I don't think that there's anything that we necessarily want to see changed. That's not necessarily a contract section that we're going to open up, but the city may, but there's certainly pieces 
in the rest of the collective bargaining agreement that we would like to have addressed. Specifically, that I run the whole thing, but I mean, apparently the chief is going to have a problem with that. That's kind of weird. I told him my arm wrist went for it, but uh, whatever. Thank you. That's actually um, more than I was expecting to get. So thank you. Okay, I have another question. So I'm curious because I'm guessing, um, Michael, that you were on the force before CAHOOTS kind of came into existence in Eugene? No, I believe CAHOOTS has been here for, for 31 years and I've only been oh. on the force for 20. And um, so I, I kind of grew up with CAHOOTS as I started out as baby cop and moved forward. Okay. So you were, but you were here when they transitioned to from one van to two vans, because that was yes, just absolutely yes. Okay. that's a fairly recent. That's a fairly recent thing. Right. So my question, I guess, is, I mean, you've always had cahoots. Um, most of the officers now on the streets have always had cahoots, and many of them have only had two cahoots vans or always had two cahoots vans. I'm, I'm curious with. The movement that you know many people call defund the police, which I think really they just mean move money over to things like cahoots. Do you think that there is more need for more cahoots or cahoots type situation help um, in in Eugene, or do you think what we have right now is is doing pretty well? I mean, we can always use more obviously more bodies in every place, <laughs> right? But sure. in the balance. But I mean, we also see that. There's a lot of things that we would hope cahoots could go out to, but because there's a any kind of threat going on, cahoots kind of can't go by themselves. I mean, and so officers have to be there. So I, I guess I'm just curious as to whether or not, you know, in the balance, do you think there would be a, a place to have more for cahoots? And because, I mean, obviously the union would say, I mean, can say, you know, we want more cahoots, we want more officers, if it becomes kind of a push-pull sort of thing. Just kind of curious as to what you think about that, if you want to say. So I think, so I think Cahoots is a very valuable pro uh, program um, to the point when I remember this, and I believe Sergeant Nelson is uh, also in, in, in the participant room here. It may have actually been with him, it may have been somebody else, where there was talk, this is years ago, for Cahoots to actually um, be completely removed because it costs too much money. And I'm talking like 2005, 2006 era. I mean, early, early on in my career. And I remember having multiple conversations with other officers when we heard this news about, you know, essentially pooling money together and say, hey, if, if you take 50 bucks out of my paycheck, they're worth that to us to actually, you know, 50, I, I was naive. I don't think $50 of the paycheck is going to make any, you know, uh, being a difference in one way or the other, but it was still the idea that it's it's an important function, and I want to make sure that uh, it continues on. Um, as it stands today, the biggest, the hardest part is for a dispatcher or a call taker to have that clear voice, and I use that term purposefully to see if it's appropriate for cahoots to even show up for this call because. What happens if they make that wrong determination and they say, go ahead, cahoots and go, and one of the cahoots folks gets, you know, injured or, God forbid, sorry, Adele is telling me that it's time for medicine. Um, <clears throat> so that's the hardest part. Is it's, it's, it's not necessarily do we need more? Maybe. I don't know. It's how do we figure out ahead of time as to what's the appropriate call? It's easy for all of us to sit here. Go through, a, you know, go through a review and say, oh, Cahoots should have gone to this. Yeah, perhaps now that we know how it ended, but we forget that we actually going through it at the time and that's hard. And I think that's the, big, that's the biggest challenge. And I think before we decide to add more of anything, we need to figure out a better matrix to determine what, could, what should go and what should not go. I hope that answers your question. I know that's kind of roundabout way, but. No, it does answer the question. I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a systems that really needs to be looked at. It's not just bodies, it's figuring out the best use of all of our resources. And, you know, and we can only use our resources to the best of their ability if we know how to, if we know how to use them, when to implement them. So, um, no, I appreciate that perspective. Thank you. Yeah.
Okay, Leah, this is when you jump in and have something to say. I was just going to say, Jose or Carolyn, I don't think that we've gotten questions from you. <laughs> I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to contribute. Hey, keeping notes, like who's asking questions or not? Do these That's folks need representation from you now? What the heck? <laughs> you know I'm writing all the time. <laughs> Me too. True. No, I... um. I appreciate you being here. I think one of the things that surprises folks when I talk to other communities about their oversight systems is, is that we have a collegial working relationship with the union. Um, and often with the department, you know, it varies when I, when I speak to different folks, but I think we all have a goal of finding out that, well, Michael's goal is to make sure that the city does their job. My goal is to make sure that there's accountability and transparency and we find the truth in the process. And I think those tend to actually align pretty often. So, um, yeah, I'm glad you- and it's, I think it's worth, it's, I think it's worth pointing out that, and I don't know if you guys know this, but Leah and I don't actually always agree on things. In fact, yeah, exactly. But what I appreciate about it is, is that we can actually have a, a frank conversation about why we disagree with each other. And at the end, still have, you know, that proverbial beer that we go out and, and then still have a cordial conversation because it's built on trust and, you know, mutual respect. And that's how I think most things need to get done in this world. I mean, I, we can certainly take the adversarial role, but it, it doesn't solve anything. It just creates more conflict. So kudos to um, both. And, and, and I know he's listening because I know he's listening. Kudos to both Leah and then also to the sergeants that are uh, in IA, both uh, Ryan Nelson and Joel Peckles, because it takes, it takes two to tango as far as building a relationship. And we think we've done a good job of getting there where we make sure that the outcome is just. Yeah. Well, thank you, Michael. I will also just share that uh, I did a ride along with Michael. It was a very eventful. So freaking cool. We ended up, we ended up catching a murderer. It was so cool. It was all We did. Yeah. Um, it was awesome. We will come back to the ride along concept later in this meeting. So I just wanted to, it was, it was all coming together for me there. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Yes. <laughs> hey, Michael, do you have a question? Which Michael, me? Oh God, you're right. I meant you, Clues. I do not have any questions. I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Other, Michael Haynes Garcia, Dr. Garcia, as they call yeah, you. Yeah, I, I actually did. Um... So I was wondering if you could just uh, walk us through, like, um, in the, your time uh, with EPD, like, what kind, what are the most positive changes you've seen in terms of in relation to the grievance and um, uh, auditor process? Changes to the auditor process, and the, <clears throat> I don't know it's pretty it's pretty regulated as it, as it relates to you know the the ordinance and whatnot. So. It's hard for me to say because since 2016, it's kind of been the same. So I don't really know what happened before. Um, I know that we are currently working on a, um, and, and, and I, we were trying to resurrect the mediation piece that, that exists in the auditor, in the, uh, auditor protocol. Um, I'm actually really excited about that. Uh, I think I may have been one of the last people to actually have utilized the um, mediation piece back in, if I lie to you, don't, don't, don't start an untruthfulness allegation against me. But like 2005, 2004, 2005, I had something that ended up being um, mediated. And it's kind of, we kind of went away from that. And we're starting to kind of re, reinvent that wheel a little bit. And I think it's going to be a really good process um, if we get it off the ground. So that, that, I mean, that would be the one. And that's actually the most recent. And then we I mean, were literally, Leah, Correct me if I'm wrong, but we're talking like a week, week and a half ago that we started even having this conversation, hopefully having our first one here in the next couple coming weeks. Yeah, I'm excited about that too. That's awesome. Thank you. If nobody else has a question, may I ask a question? 
So Michael, hi, nice to see your face. Um, you said something in a meeting uh, a while back that really impacted me that I think would be interesting to hear more about. Um, you were talking, so we were just speaking about cahoots and officers and kind of finding that balance and trying to figure out, you know, when is the right per place to call. But the thing that you said in the meeting that impacted me was kind of the toll that responding to sort of intractable problems at the police level on the street has on you. So not just the toll of maybe um, what I might perceive to be very high stress calls uh, where there's a lot of like violence or trauma going on, but sort of the everyday traumas of, of working with people who are unhoused or who have addiction issues. And that it just really impacted me. I would love to hear what you think about sort of upstream things that might be supportive because I feel like both police and cahoots are still crisis response, but you were, I think the direct quote that I wrote down from you was something like, um, it's the calls where I can't do anything to fix it that were the most difficult for you. So anyway, do you mind speaking about that a little bit? No, I didn't know that you were writing down my quotes. I can sign them for you. So they you were noteworthy. I mean, I would love your signature. <laughs> No, the, I'm going to butcher this and, and I'm going to apologize right up front. But uh, Sarah Maderi, she, she talks about purpose and it's where your training and your desire meet or something like that. It's actually a famous quote and I'm totally butchering it right now and I apologize. And that's, you know, that's, that, that's your purpose and that's where we absolutely love to be. So what uh, Lindsay is talking about is kind of the idea of, <clears throat> excuse me, Running into the running into a burning building, I believe that's that's the that's the example that I gave where we are there to deal with a you know homicide suicide where the potential husband actually is burning the hot, the building down and some would call that a very high stressful scenario and I think those are in many ways much much easier for us to deal with because we train for it we we, we we learn how to do the tactical piece. We want to go and help. We want to do those um, extraordinary, her heroic, if you want to call them things. And those are much easier to deal with. In this particular case, unfortunately, both the suspect and the victim were deceased and then are being obviously burned because the whole house burnt down. Um, but sorry, I didn't stop that. Still good? Okay. I have, a, I have a reminder that I need to take some meds, so it goes off occasionally. I apologize. But those kind of calls are easy, much easier for us to deal with because we train for them, and it's what we're there for. We're, we're there to do that heroic stuff. The hardest one, some of the hardest ones is the, 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 the repetitive going to the trespass calls, going to the unhoused calls, because we can't fix it. We are fixers. You know, we, we, are, we are rule followers, and we are fixers. And we want to fix things. We want to fix them immediately. And unfortunately, we don't have that capacity. And those are the ones where it can wear on you. It's that it's it's the idea of having a small pebble in your shoe. And maybe that's not the best. Um, maybe that's not the best. That's maybe that's not the best analogy. But it's the it's not that acute stress. It's that that lingering, ongoing, and that that takes that takes a toll on us. And I think that's where you at times see those um, those courtesy complaints. Frankly. Thank you. I think we need to let him go take his medicine, please. <laughs> Thank you, Bernadette. I appreciate you looking out for my health. Thank you. Everybody else, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bernadette. Thank you, Michael, right. for, for coming in. You're welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you for having. Thank you for having me. I really do appreciate that. Um, I'm going to give out this invitation. If anybody wants to go grab a cup of coffee and talk one-on-one, -on -one, I am always, I'm always available. Leah has my contact information. So if you're interested, cup of Joe's on me and I'm happy to chat with you guys. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm glad he, he was supposed to be here last month, right? So I'm glad that you were able to reschedule that. Thank you for doing that. Um, and the last thing we have 
before the break is selection of liaisons to police commission and human rights commission we're missing clay and bill bill won't be part of it because he's not going to be here so as long as we're uh, leah i just i had a thought and just that um no we're always talking about the timing of this i'll stop talking sorry i just i was thinking about how a council has to approve a police they have to sort of sign off and appoint somebody to the police commission as well so it was just i had a momentary thought of what if it would be what if we did this at our june meeting and then they would be appointing all the folks at the same time but um but i also know that it's been a while since we did this <laughs> so um so it's up to you we're just offering that timing point the only hesitation i have to doing it tonight is whether or not Clay would be interested in one of the roles. Um, I don't know, do we have, could we text him or anything? Just well, we could uh, ask everybody, we could sort of talk about the roles a little bit more, um, sort of to Alan's point about our, our informal onboarding process. Maybe it would be good to talk more about those roles and then gauge interest over the next month and do it at the next month's meeting. Sorry, I'll stop talking. Yeah, I just have a question then. Um, I'm, I'm confused about the composition of the board only because um, uh, there who there's three term, I mean, so in other, if it, it seems odd to decide this if it's gonna be a newly constituted board it, or certainly without Clay, you know, I, I'm a little hesitant to, to to go if it's going to be new people. That's all. Thanks. Yeah, I I will say historically. Go ahead, Michael. Sorry. Is anyone going? Because Bernadette and I are in the same are synced in terms of terms. I don't think anyone else is with us, right? Correct. But Bill Whalen is moving, so he's that's right. I forgot. Done. Um, I would say historically, new folks. We, we try not to give new folks the liaison appointments to give them a little time to get their feet under them. Um, but you're right, Alan, I mean, if we if we end up with a lot of new folks, it's gonna be tough. So I'm just offering that. We will support whatever this board decides to do. I guess the first question would be, would any is anybody here present who's planning on continuing on the board um, interested in either of the community or the police commission or the the other one human rights commission i could possibly be interested in the police commission however i would really like to have a discussion with michael before I'm not, I didn't come to this meeting prepared to make that decision. If someone else wants to step up and it get filled right now, that would be okay with me, but I'm not ruling it out, but I'm not prepared to step up. Okay, so maybe instead of doing this election this week, maybe we could take this 10 minutes or probably six minutes left and kind of explain what those roles are um, and kind of what they entail, because really it's different since COVID, because typically we would have liaisons from those boards also come to our meetings, and I haven't seen any of them ever the whole time we've been virtual. Um, so it's a different, it's a whole different thing. And I and I don't know, it sounds like maybe the other two boards aren't meeting quite as often, or it's harder to get in touch with them than it used to be. So that's a thought, Michael. Yeah, I think um, I, so the, the police commission liaison from the from the CRB is the police is the relays on both directions. So no one from the police commission ever comes here. It's just the um, the human rights commission that sends someone. Is that correct, Leah? I see Leah nodding. That's absolutely right. Yeah, and Michael is still Michael's term on the police commission lasts through June as well. So we don't have any urgency really on the police commission appointment. Um, on the HRC liaison, we have a little more flexibility and this this can go into a quick intro on the positions right so um so per the C, the ordinance crb has one member selects one member who we request to city council be appointed to police commission also so city council actually does the appointing that member actually sits and is a voting member on both this board 
and the police commission. Um, the job is focused on, and Michael can speak to this obviously <laughs> as I'm just talking, um, but the point is to sort of often policy issues come up in our cases that liaison takes those policy issues to police commission, tries to get them focused on or worked on over there um, so that they have an official line of input on what we're reviewing, what you guys are seeing to policy changes over there, if that makes sense. Michael, did I miss anything? Yeah, the other thing, that, and I think this is in the, um, the ordinance as well, the police commission or the me, uh, the li liaison ends up being the person as well who handles uh, redirects. So a lot of times people will contact the commission or commissioners individually uh, with complaints. And so it's kind of the, the person who's like uh, sort of like a goalie, like you're you're kicking them off to the side and into the, the auditor's net. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then um, for, oh, Alan. Uh, well, no, I didn't want I didn't want to interrupt. Um, my question for Michael was we, we've heard and, and I will talk hopefully that this is still open after, you know, if, it, if we don't decide. Um, but we heard I'm sure we heard from you that um, their agenda is is like fixed in stone for the next two years and they're they're very rigid and you and nothing new. Is it is it uh, meaningful? Like our role is it is it important as far as from the direction the the redirect you just talked about? I get that probably comes up a ton, but from our direction to them, is it a, is it a meaningful liaison? Um. So in in my brief experience, I would say that it can be. I think that it involves uh, um, sort of knowing how to, well, so I use my, with, with the courtesy one, it was a pretty simple one. So I just used my opening comment uh, time for the police commission to, to bring that up and the chief was, took notes, he's very responsive. Um, and so that got heard right away. As far as the other things, um, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that the, 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 they have this work plan and they are pretty wedded to it except when they're not. <laughs> and so uh, I think it depends on who the leadership, who the, the chair and vice chair are. I see Leah nodding again. Um, she has more experience with this. So I, I think like if there was something really pressing that I think the CRB wanted heard, uh, I could probably work with Leah to, to communicate directly with the, the chair and, and get it on the agenda sooner. I, I, don't, I don't think that'd be a problem. I, will, I just I want to point out that I, I agree with Michael that I think it's leadership dependent. I'm going to point out we also have a sort of unusual circumstance of both Bernadette and Lindsay actually have served in this role also. Um, so we have we have sort of a, a lot of experience here of who have people who have sat on CRB and police commission. Bernadette, you want to say something? I saw you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that What's really valuable about our having a seat at the police commission table is their intent is to be a proactive advisory board to the chief. So they look at things and they advise the chief as to what they think the chief should do with regards to policy changes. Whereas our board is a reactive board based on what what has happened and what, how the policy was implemented and how it worked or didn't work or what tweaks need to happen. So our seat at the police commission is just merely, as I like to think of it as a, a well-informed advice to the chief because we see those policies in action, whereas many of the other board members don't have the same perspective that we do, they don't have, they don't have the ability to know how the how the the policy is actually working in real life. And so, when I was on the board, we were going over the Taser policy, and one of the things that the board members kept forgetting over and over and over again, in my opinion, is the fact that we are an advisory board, and they wanted to 
wordsmith everything and changed. They wanted the policy to have very specific wording on things. And they missed the point that, I mean, you can make the point that yes, you'd like specific words, but ultimately the chief is sitting at the table and here's those specific words that you want used. And then he will put it in there or not. And I think a lot of time got stuck in in that situation where it was like, we just kept talking and talking and talking about how it should actually be worded and missed the point that it's like, it was the discussion that the chief needed to hear about why we wanted specific words, not keep arguing about it has to have these words. And so I think that's the value in our being at that table is that we get to take a position of, of I think just more in, you know, um, education, I guess, um, because we've read these cases. And so when we go there, we can say, well, this is how we saw the policy written. And, and I also know that on my time from the police commission, when cases were coming before the board and we, I would take them there and I would say, this was the case that we reviewed last week. And this was the problem we saw with it. Often the chief would, would go ahead and change the policy, you know, over a couple of months and not put it through the police commission. And so, so, I mean, I think our, probably our most value at being at that table is the fact that we get to report back on what we do in this body. So the chief, so we know the chief is hearing it. I mean, we, we know the chief is hearing it because, you know, we know that people here are taking it back to him. Um, but I think to actually be at a table where we can look him in the eye or she at some point in time, maybe in life, um, and say, this is, this is what we you know, this is what we talked about, and this is why we decided what we decided. So, sorry, that was a really long-winded way of saying what I wanted to say. Thank you, Bernadette. Um, and I'm going to talk about the HRC. Oh, Michael. Yeah, I'll just chime in one last little bit. Um, so, Bern so that's basically Bernadette. Bernard, that's exactly right. That's basically how the courtesy thing happened. It didn't have to get on the police commission's agenda. Um, I just, I just meant, brought it up, and chief took care of it. Um, I, I would, my, I would say that the problem with the police commission is that it is, it, it's a lot like student government. It, uh, it's a lot of wordsmithing. It's a lot of people arguing about like the commas and where it goes, and um, and it's not clear that. Uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just say that. So there's, realistically, that is a big part of it. Thank you. And and thank you to everyone who has who has been in that position. Because <laughs> I, I do, I think it's an, an important um, communication line. Uh, if you like the Robert's Rules of Order, you will love the Police Commission. If you don't like Robert's Rules of Order, you will go a little insane. Right, Michael? Yes, uh, and also I should add, Leah is also at the, or someone from the auditor's office is always at those meetings as well. And so you're not on your own. Like there's been many times when I could not remember <laughs> because I forgot that I had to report on the, the CRB meetings. And so I, I, have not, oh, I don't know what we did last month and Leah would just chime in, it was great. I'm always lurking, even when I have COVID. It was great last month, pale face coming in through the dark. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry. So, so that is police commission. Uh, Human Rights Commission is a slightly different arrangement where we appoint someone on our board to be a liaison. That's not somebody who is appointed to the Human Rights Commission like they are appointed to the police commission. So when we would meet in physical rooms, which may occur again at some point, um, the HRC liaison will sit in the audience and just sort of listen to what they're saying. They have a time on their agenda like we have a time on our agenda where you can get reports from liaisons. So it's usually, they would stand up, say, this is what we talked about at CRB, listen to any feedback and bring that back to us. Um, and then they do a similar in normal times. They have someone who attends our meetings and is kind of listening too. So it's kind of a duplicate liaison role, but it's basically one person who sits on HRC comes to watch us, but they don't sit at our table. One person from our group goes to watch them and doesn't sit at their table. Um, Usually one of us is there, usually Beatrice and Vicky go to HRC. I, I have too many night meetings. <laughs> so I, I had to set some boundaries. Um, but that's just sort of a quick overview. Jose is currently our HRC liaison, but he has been 
HRC liaison during the COVID times. So it hasn't been like a, a typical appointment. Um, so I will do whatever the group wants to do. What I'm hearing, and please tell me if I'm wrong, is that perhaps we check in with Clay and we come back to this topic either next month or maybe even May or June, depending, just because knowing that Michael's appointment is gonna last that long, I believe Jose's is as well. Carolyn, I think in general, if we move this to June, that gives people almost a full year to, to get their feet under them and then we could go. I don't know. We can talk about that at executive group, but. Okay, I think for now we should postpone it from tonight, but um, yeah, it, we, we can talk about if it should be in April, May, or June, which would make the most sense. That makes sense, Bernadette and Leah. Okay. So um, that means it's time for a break. And I think we should take a five minute break because I need to get more water. Um, so we can reassemble at 6.33. All right, we're back. Um, most of us are back. Leah, are you doing the case review or have you delegated that? I just delegated it. <gasps> Good job. In a very unfair and untimely way. <laughs> Lindsay, do you, I, I made a few edits to it, but it's all saved in the IA docs. So do you have access to it? Did you make the edits in the last five minutes? No. Okay, then I will pull it up. Hold on. I had it open on my desktop just in case. Okay, thank you. I'm technologically challenged. So let me share screen. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, we're ready. I'll just go through. I will do what you're not supposed to do with PowerPoint presentations, and I'm just going to read this to you. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, so this is the case review this evening is the allegation related to search and seizure. So here's the summary of the facts. So officers A, B, and C were dispatched to do a welfare check at a parking lot. An employee at a nearby business had called the communication center to tell them that there was a person passed out in a vehicle in front of the business and the car was sitting in the traffic lane straddling a speed bump. Officers responded to the location and made contact with the occupant of the car who in this case is the reporting party. So from now on that person is going to be referred to as a reporting party. So they were asleep in the driver's seat of the vehicle. Officers began asking the reporting party questions about alcohol and drug use prior to their stop. Eventually, the reporting party opened their glove box while looking for documents that were requested by Officer A. Officer C was in a position to uh, see in the passenger side of the vehicle when the reporting party opened the glove box, and Officer C motioned to Officers B and A to remove the reporting party from the vehicle. The reporting party was removed from the vehicle, placed in handcuffs, and searched. Officer C told the reporting party they believed they saw a handgun in the glove box of the vehicle and requested permission to search. Reporting party told Officer C there was no handgun in the glove box and did not consent to a search of their vehicle. Reporting party was placed in the back of a, the patrol car and three, the three officers had a discussion with their body-worn video microphones muted. After the discussion, Officer A entered the reporting party's vehicle and opened their glove box. The reporting party filed a complaint with the auditor's office to complain that officers were rude and searched their vehicle without permission. So the allegations were related to this policy, 322.7.3, search and seizure. The allegation was that the officer searched the reporting party's glove box in violation of this policy. This uh, 
one was interesting in terms of adjudication recommendations. Um, the auditor recommended that the allegation of misconduct be sustained. The EPG chain of command had, um, there was a memo included in your packet that um, where they said they believed it was insufficient evidence. And the chief's final adjudication was that it was within policy. So the issues for CRB discussion, and then I'll leave it to you, are the complaint intake classification and monitoring. Um, this is a community generated complaint and was an allegation of misconduct. The relevant policy is related to search and seizure. And you can discuss policies, practices, and training considerations, and then adjudication recommendations. And there's a summary of the way that the adjudications shuffled out in this case. So I think with that, oh, pardon me. Uh, this is a list of the materials that were provided for you to review, including the body-worn cameras, the IAPRO reports, the correspondence, adjudication recommendation memo from the chain of command, another one from the auditor, another one from the chief, um, the relevant policies, and the police reports and dispatch records. I think with that, you can discuss. And do you want me to leave this up, or would you prefer to just have faces? I prefer faces. OK, great. Then I will stop sharing and mute myself. Thank you. Um, OK. I will we'll get going with our order and I'll put it back in the chat. Um, but before we do, I wanted to say that I am socially connected to the city prosecutor who was um, the, they talked to him. They, what's that word? I don't know. I had an opinion maybe. Yeah. Um, consulted. But, consulted, that's the ticket. Um, but that that won't make it that won't make me impartial i can still discuss and i don't know that that has really come up before in our meetings since we've had some new members so we do try to kind of disclose when we know an involved person and recuse ourselves if we feel like we can't um, be impartial and have a fair discussion in this case i can but we will start with the first well maybe just I'll open the floor to that. Does anyone else have anyone else connected to the case that they need to disclose? Leah, you don't? <laughs> okay. Um, and then Michael, can you start us with the complaint intake classification investigation and monitoring topic? Sure. Um, so I don't have a lot on in this part. Well, actually, um, so Leah, I'm wondering if you could walk us through uh, the decision, because there are a lot of things that, that are alleged in, um, in, on the part of the reporting party. Um, well, it's, uh, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of things that come up, right? And I think I know why we have uh, before us the search and seizure as, as the, the one that's singled out. But if you could just walk us through that process, especially since folks are new and stuff. Yes, sure. Um, so this was, this came in last summer, um, it came in as a community complaint. Uh, to the best of my memory, and let's all be clear, it's questionable, but this is what I remember. Uh, we watched the video and the, the, the main allegation that I got from the complaint was the courtesy issue. There, you know, the RP had a, a that, that was the focus of what I was looking for when I watched the video. Uh, when I watched the video, and Ryan can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think originally, on first glance, I thought the glove box search was probably okay. Um, so I believe we started with it as an incident review to look into just the, the whole incident overall. You know, are there policy violations that need to be looked into? The body worn video issue came up, and then the uh, case law changed or I, I was updated on the case law <laughs> on the automobile exception. And so the, the glove box search became a pretty glaring issue, uh, at least for me. So that's what we ended up focusing on sort of once, once we realized it appeared to me to be a pretty clear policy violation on the search and seizure issue with the search of the glove box. That's the one that we focused on going forward. 
Um, and I'm going to stop talking there. I hope that answers. You, yeah, you also. Yes, okay. I was thinking it was originally started off as as courtesy and then got reclassified. Um, but you also raised issues about the um, the body cam uh, muting in your yeah. memo, but that's not sort of before us as a, as an issue. Right. It's. <laughs> So this has been one of those things that I uh, obviously have been struggling with, right? They are allowed to mute it. They are allowed to mute it for tactics. Once it has been muted, it's really hard to say if they muted it for tactics, right? <laughs> um, so this has definitely come up. This has come up with the ad hoc discussions. This has come up so much over the last couple of years. I know the chief has at different times stated that um, he was looking at taking away the muting option. I don't know where he is on that right now, um, but I will say that's been an issue. I think I tend to, the line has been moving, I guess. And, and so this, I'm gonna be really <laughs> upfront with you all. The line has been moving. At that point in time, I believe I was sort of at a stage where if they were turning off their cameras and, and then turning them back on later in the same contact, that was bothering me. I would open up a body a violation on that. For when there's when there's muting, and they may be muting for tactics, it it was hard to say. And and so I'm open. I'm really open to feedback on how to handle that issue because unfortunately, as much as I wish it would stop happening, it's it's definitely still happening. Thank you. I appreciate the the um, the walkthrough there. Uh, so I don't have anything else uh, to say about about this. Um, just uh, curious about the how the how the process worked of um, classification. Um, let's skip Jose for now because he. Oh, there he is. Oh. Uh, okay, so we're in intake and classification. Classification seems right to me. Um, I know this is going to be kind of a, a, a heavy thing to swing around right now, but this is one of this, this is one of the fur one of the, I don't know, the few situations where I feel like there is interpretation of the facts on the part of the in the language of the memorandum, memoranda that seem to be trying to help the officer's case involved. In my memoranda or in the investigative report? In the investigative report. Okay, sorry, I just wanted to be clear about what we were talking about. So I'm, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna throw things around uh, like that around lightly, but, um, yeah, there's a lot of um, the. I, I had also noticed that the 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 chief, the chain of command, and the auditor's office had pretty divergent takes on this, and that at best it looks to be insufficient evidence. So, I guess I guess that's what the the comment that I had here is that. Um, I had some questions about body worn video as well, but I'll wait until um, policy and procedures for that. But this is this is one this is one where language sticks out to me as to be um, yeah trying to trying to advocate for officers rather than in uncover facts. I, I I'm I'm intrigued by that, Jose, because what I find interesting about it is the first two in the chain of command um, thought that what the officer did was wrong. And so I, it's, it's, it's interesting to me that it, you, you think that there's a way that it was written in such a way that might have been dismissive of the officer's actions. Um, I'm not negating it. I just, it's an interesting, it, the, the whole chain of command and is interesting in this situation to me. Um, so with regards to tactical muting you know sometimes it's very clear that tactical muting is that the muting is happening for tactical reasons because 
they're getting ready. I mean, we've seen it in some of our cases where they're getting ready to take somebody into custody and talking about how they're going to do that, how they're going to approach the person um, that they mute for that reason. I, I, I can't understand what the tactic here was, except they they don't want us to know, I wanna say they don't want us to know who they talk to, because I don't think that's exactly what it is. Um, but in, in essence, it's like you've got three officers talking to three different people or doing you know at least two different things. Um, I do find I, I do find it troubling that um, that there wasn't any attempt to contact a chain of command at the scene. That you know we're contacting the street crimes unit as opposed to contacting a supervisor, and it was the person with the most experience out there that was contacting street crimes unit rather than a supervisor. Um, so, I, so I find that interesting. I'm not sure that there's really a question to ask, you know, why would you do that over the other? I mean, I'm guessing that it's just, there's a lot of reasons, but I'm not sure that the answers to it would be helpful for us. Um, I think certainly knowing it's like, is there any tactical reason that could have justified muting here um, is something that, that I would find in, it would be helpful for me to know what, what that situation would be. Um, I find it challenging the fact that there was no report written on this one. Um, and I know that there's a reason that, you know, probably they didn't write a report because no one was arrested. You know, there was, you know, it, but it, but it makes it harder. I remember one of the first IA surgeons that, um, I worked with when I was on first on the CRB, um, Jerry Weber, you know, his response always, when he would talk to the officers is, you know, write it down, ask all the questions, talk to everybody, because I can't, you know, make heads or tails of things if you don't write it down and talk to everybody. And, you know, that kind of came back to me as I'm looking at this one, because it's like, it's not written down and all the questions weren't asked. I mean, did anybody touch the, the hood of this car to see if it was, you know, engine warm? Did anybody look to see, you know, if there was anybody that had seen this person driving this car that would make this um, an exception under the then the mobility? Um, so there were there were there were things that I, I can't fault IA for it because I'm not sure asking IA what I think was probably a pretty obvious question. No, they didn't do these things because if they'd done any of these things, there again we would hope that there would be a report. So I, I think for me, it's not the intake or classification um, that's so troubling. It's the lack of information that we had for IA to investigate um, by not having that report, by the officers you know, not asking any of those questions on the scene. Um, and I, I, I also wonder why the officers wanted to use the exception to look for the, the the knife gun in the glove box, but they don't make any further mention of, of following up with the drugs because there's a syringe there. And so it's like, they're taking this person's word that the syringe is, somebody has a medical need for it, but they're not taking the word for it that the it's a knife in there. Um, so I just, I, I found some of those things kind of interesting, troubling, questionable. Um, I think one of the other things is that the officer with the most longevity out there, um, I mean, in the criminal field, you can do an aid and a bet. And I think we have seen this before where one officer gets the answer, gives it to the other officer who then follows through and the person following through gets, in, gets investigated, but the person that has directed them to take that action. Now I get it that you ultimately you get to decide your actions for yourself, but this is an officer with, I think it was less than two years experience being directed by somebody with eight to 10 years experience. Um, it just seems like there, and I don't know, I mean, maybe there's not any kind of allegation that can be investigated and reviewed um, on a situation like that. Um, if they were the, if they were an FTO um, and they directed it, I think there might have been an allegation is that correct, Leah? I think if it was an FTO or a sergeant or a supervisor, if there's an indication that we had an, that this officer A was ordered or really, or directed, and I will say like, yes, A, that would have been different. 
yeah, I'll just, sorry. I'm, I was about to go into a long thing and I'm not, that's not helpful. <laughs> and I, I guess it's a, it's a distinction that yeah, obviously if they're directing somebody to do it, then that, yes, they can be held responsible for the actions then. But when a younger officer or an officer with less experience is relying upon an officer with more experience, um, yeah, I, I just wonder, it's like, how does that get handled at some point in time? You know, where's the kind of the, the circling back to make sure that, you know, the person that, and even so far as to the person who was on the phone that gave information to the officer on the scene that said, yeah, this is fine. Right. Um, and so I, I think those are the kind of things that, that I kind of struggled with in the intake and classification because it was like, these things are all going through my mind and it's like, you know, I don't want to go to the, the low hanging fruit, which is they weren't courteous or, you know, they muted when they shouldn't have muted. You know, I mean, those are sorts of things. I think that the search and seizure is the, the one that we really should be looking at because it really is the most important. Um, it's just unfortunate that in a situation like that, there wasn't enough in, information extemporaneous to the incident to be able to answer these questions a little bit better. Yeah. And I definitely wrestled with that trying to figure out what to do. And I think I just, the, the timing of this when I was kind of going through it and for, for tonight and trying to remember exactly why I did what I did. Um, and one of the issues was, you know, we watched the video, the, the timing of the investigation is we watched the video. Um, I think we talked to the prosecutor next and then we talked to the other officers B and C. So we had already spoken to them as witnesses because that part, that conversation was muted we didn't know if Officer A just decided to go over and do it. You know, Officer A was flipping through his resource book and just, you know, just decided to go over and do it. Or if Officers B and C said, go do it, or hey, maybe you can. You know, we didn't, we didn't have that context going into the interviews. Um, so I don't know. That that helped reframe it for me in, in the way that it in the chronological way that it happened. Okay, so in the context of uh, intake and classification, like my overall impression differs um, a little bit from Bernadette's in that I viewed it, they didn't believe about the syringe being medical and I saw a stop that was an effort, it appeared to be to find a reason to um, uh, arrest this person, presumably for DUI. And that's why I find the muting problematic. Um, be in that overall context. So for intake and classification, the muting was one you've addressed and thank you for addressing it. The other one was the search, the crumpled up little piece of paper being uncrumpled. That was such clearly a search for drugs. If I'm wrong and that's legal, but if, if it was a wet, if it was only a, a pat down for weapons, which was said repeatedly on the, on the audio of the, the body worn camera, then that search was problematic. And in the context of the complaint being for search and seizure, I, I was troubled also by that. I just felt that the whole thing was, let, let's find a reason to arrest this guy. Even though we heard contrary statements on the body worn audio that that was not their intent. Um, you know, so, um, but in taking classification, it was the muting and the other search. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that perspective. I really do. Thank you. I agree. Um, I think with, I'm glad that you were able to clarify what Michael was asking. And again, what Alan kind of was hinting at or talking about just now, um, not hinting at, it was clear. Um, and I agree in the end with the complaint intake and classification, but I do, I do understand and appreciate that it, it always takes a lot of thought. And I'm glad that now you have two other people on your team who you can use to help ensure that you're you're doing the right um, allegations. I Me did too. see um, <laughs> I did see Ryan turn his camera on after Jose's comments and I didn't know if Ryan wanted to um, engage with that or not. No, that's okay. I was just I was turning it on and then I had a bunch of dogs start barking and I had to go shut them up because I I have two kids that are not being quiet. So sorry. Okay, so that was everybody on that one. Um, 
we are going to move on now to EPD policies, practices, and training. And this time we'll have Jose start us off. Forgive me. I'm just, I'm, I'm getting really pissed off at the, the muting. Um, I, I don't think we should, I don't think we should trust anybody to redact their own records in any context, in any industry ever. It should not be on, it should not be on folks who we know are on cognitive overload in the field to make a decision like that. We don't want them, we don't, we don't want to, we don't want to, as an, as an issue of labor, we don't want to put people, our, our, our workers in positions to be making choices um, that could affect their employment in high stress situations. It just doesn't make sense. Like we don't allow other people to redact their own records. Let's just hire somebody to like, as soon as, if, if there's ever a reason we need body worn video, we have a dedicated record specialist who does the redacting, who, who is an expert on policy so that officers don't have to be on muting. Let's just get it out of the way as a matter of policy and, and stop. It's kind of silly that we have to have these conversations at this point, in my opinion. Um, not to say that I don't trust officers, but to say that the, the that that I I I don't trust anybody to redact their own records. Um, uh, I keep coming back to this passed out, uh, which which seems to be a load bearing term in this in this case, um, and especially in, in light of the context that, that Alan brought up previously. Um, I do have a question um, uh, specifically for uh, Leah. Let me, let, me, let me pick this out. So the, the, ex, the, uh, the exception, um, the list in that, so the, the word and on that list, does that require someone to be in the vehicle? I'm gonna to try to find this uh, specific. I've gotta find my language too. <laughs> okay. So it says, okay. The automobile exception applies only quote, if the automobile is mobile when the officers first encounter it, in connection with the investigation of a crime, end quote. Okay, so right now the mobility part of this is is a deduction at 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 you know full stop. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It does not apply, quote, if the car is parked, unoccupied, and immobile when officers first encounter it, end quote. And does that mean it must be parked, it must be unoccupied, and it must be immobile, all three of them together? Yes. Yes. So I, I thought it was interesting that the chief's letter says that the facts of this case are not in dispute when in fact they are. So that's where I thought that's just to clarify my comment earlier. I'm like, I think I would take issue with the fact that there is nothing in dispute here. And yeah. To, to clarify, Jose, when I... I asked earlier if you were asking about my memo or the investigative report, and you said the investigative report, but now you're talking about the chief's memo. So is it actually the memo from the chain of command? Excuse me, it's the memo from the yeah, chain of command. Excellent. No, that's good to know because- Sorry I, to clarify. I was probably worried I'm about- not I'm not trying to take aim at, at IA. Okay. I, think it was, I think it was a great investigation. Okay, thank you. That's I'm good. sorry, Ryan. No, that helps to know. <laughs> no, I appreciate the clarification. I was, I was wanting to check in with you later on and see what, uh, get some criticism on that, but uh, I, that's helpful for me. Thank you. It's, mo it's really more of a, a consequence of, um, you know, having taught two classes today and then coming here. So yeah, yes. miss, but miss speaking. You're doing great, Jose. Don't worry about it at all. Uh, yeah, and that, uh, um, that, that wraps up my quote or, or my, my, my. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the issue that, um, that street crimes was contacted rather than the chain of command. Um, to ask a question about clarification. 
I mean, as, and I, I think it's so important with the newer officers to have them do it the right way. Um, and Sergeant Nelson, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like the right way is to ask a supervisor, not ask um, street crimes. If we're talking about what does this drug look like, calling street crimes seems to make the most sense. If we're calling, if we're wondering, how do you think the yaw on this tire skid in the street happened, calling somebody an accident reconstruction makes more sense than calling the supervisor. But when you're talking about the person that's supposed to be your go-to to ask questions, especially with regards to something like search and seizure law, seems to me the supervisor is the person that you should that the officer should have gone to to ask those specific questions. Tell me I'm wrong. No, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. Uh, but I will say that um, as a unit, they have much more experience in that than uh, probably even some of our supervisors do. Uh, because it's something they're doing all the time. What I would have preferred to see is them contact the supervisor of that unit, which would have been ideal. Okay. I guess my other question um, has to do with the length of time of the chain of command. Um, because I know some of the names um, in the chain of command that, that wrote memos here. And what I find interesting is the names of the people that were were probably more holding the officer accountable here were people, names of I recognize, so therefore on the force a little longer, than the people that were saying what they did was okay. I mean, up to the chief. I mean, he has less time. I can call him he, right? Because we know who the chief is. So, um, I mean, he's got less time in our community and our policy, and granted, most of these policies are probably similar across the board, uh, but I just find it troubling that the chain of command decides to go against what the city prosecutor would have said is a, 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 a bad search. Um, because and it was always my pet peeve when I worked in the DA's office that officers would start arguing with me about points of law because they had had their constitutional law class in training. And Sometimes the conversations would have to end with, well, when you go to law school and you pass the bar, you can come back and make that argument to the court. And that's what I felt with, like I wanted to say here is, or I want the city prosecutor to actually say it too, and the chief and the chain of command. And so I just find it, it, it really troubling that here's, a, here's somebody who is trained in, in advising them as to the legality of things and they're setting it aside and saying that this was within policy, not the insufficient evidence, but actually within policy. Um, so I guess I would like the chain of command trained on how to actually have a conversation with legal counsel and actually believe them when they say what the law is. Sorry, that sounds a little flip, but it, it's, it's pretty frustrating. That's all. Ah, you, you fill the plate. Um... This is a concept that's not, uh, uh, that's a little bit difficult for people to sometimes grasp, but um, uh, in Oregon, a police officer who subjectively believes that a, a traffic infraction is committed in front of them can stop the vehicle, even if they were wrong in their head about what that ORS said, that they subjectively believed at the moment. And this is an example of that, where we have a policy that is allowing what appears to be a bad search upheld on the subjective belief of the officer that that they were acting in a manner that was appropriate. It, it, fundamentally, I have problems with both ideas that if it's against the law, it probably should not be within policy. It just ought to be something that, it, that uh, you know, um, but but that is that that window of weirdness in the law does exist. And that's what's going on here is that, you know, subjectively, they thought um, I will go back. I'm, I'm going to um, go to Sergeant Ryan just briefly on the investigation. I, I, I meant to bring this up on the on the interviews of of B and C. Whoever you talk to first, if the if the point of the interviews was to find out about the muting, and we all and some of us are upset a little bit about the muting, then your your interviews actually lead them right into. I want to talk about the muting and and 
after the first one, the second one is officer so-and-so says you were talking about, you tell them what the substance of the conversation was and you ask for confirmation. And I would, when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's not, that, that, that's a little bit to Jose's point. I, I didn't read the whole thing as feeling that it was soft on the officers, but I did notice that. And it's not criticism. It's just pointing out that uh, it should, uh, it ought to be more open-ended and in my view, when you're talking to them, tell me, what did you guys talk about instead of, you know, and if I'm, if you, you can listen, if, you know, it's not super important. On the total issue of this stop and the policies and the practice and the training, there was a lot of cynicism expressed by the officers in the unmuted portion. Um, the comment about they don't want us to find an eight ball, they don't want us to do, you know, if they don't want us, we'll dust them off. And uh, that there was just a kind of, um, attitude of, of wanting to, to get this guy. Um, and I just found it, I don't know if in the process of when you review, you get so narrow to search and seizure and that one search of opening the glove box. And this is, this is thematic for me. I think in all of these cases, there are learning points along the way. And I know that it's your un their union members and this is a grievance process and stuff. But when I see that cynicism um, and it gets narrowed down and the only thing that's talked about in the process is that he opened the glove or, or they opened the glove box, um, it seems like there's a, a lost opportunity in terms of the training. And but but otherwise, um, uh, that's it. Thank you. Alan, thanks. That, that's a good point. And uh, I honestly don't even didn't even recognize that I did that. But I try to be real open with that. Uh, and just want to know what was being said at the time. And it sounds like I did it on one and then I didn't on the other. So it's a it's a good reminder to make sure. Thanks. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna echo a lot of what people have said. Um, I think the amount of muting was clearly beyond tactical. And I think that if our policy is going to remain at tactical only, then it needs to be followed um, at the bare minimum. I would I would hope that we can change a policy to more what Jose was saying of, of no muting at all. And um, I don't know, I'd like to propose that Michael takes this to police commission. And I don't know how that works if we need to vote or if we can just say Michael take it to police commission to change the policy to not allow muting or um, ask for a vote is what I'm being told. So we need to vote. Can Are we voting to have Michael take that policy to the police commission? Just raise your hand. Yes, if you would like. Can I ask a clarification? Because I thought my understanding in the past was that um, I, I, I can talk about what the CRB talked about and that this issue came up, but that um, when there was there was a something similar in the past, I can't remember when it was, but um, the there was it was clear that I, I was not a representative of I wasn't speaking on behalf of the CRB, but I could say members of the CRB had this concern and does that sound right? Or yeah, maybe it was we didn't vote. I don't know. I think that was it. I think I think that was it was either not a unanimous vote or we didn't vote or but I do remember I have that vague memory as well. Um, but yeah, I think if the group were to vote on this, then it would be an express, then it's just it's just bringing it slightly in a slightly different manner. But I think even without a vote, Michael, you're more than welcome to be like, members of the CRB were very concerned about the muting, except I was going to say excessive muting, but I'm going to editorialize and try not to do that. Okay, so I think that clears it up. I think what we should do is probably wait till after the case and maybe between the case review and the auditor report, we can just do a quick vote on whether or not we want Michael to officially take this to the police commission. Is that is that accurate? Okay, so that's my concern. I, I would say that um, it was excessive muting. I will editorialize that as much as you want. Um, I do have another question um, for Ryan, probably. I did notice that the reporting party was, um, and I might have the timing wrong, but I tried to check and I think I'm right. Um, the reporting party was read their Miranda rights. And then um, later, the re this isn't kind of connected to anything that we're talking about, but the reporting party also 
said, I want to talk to my lawyer. And the officer said, you can't do that. And the reporting party said, why? And the officer said, because you're handcuffed. Um, so I'm curious about that. Do I have that wrong? Or, I mean, Leah, you look confused. I don't remember. I don't remember that. I don't remember that either. Uh, where no, where did that come from? Was. That's the what lawyer it was. request came before the Miranda is my recollection, just my I, but recollection. But it, it also came after because it came a couple times. He told me, but he did say you can't call your lawyer right now because you're handcuffed. He didn't give a better reason than that. Or another reason, I should say, not a better reason, another reason. So I guess my question is, is that a typical policy? Because that feels like it's maybe not um in keeping in line with the Miranda rights if 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 I have the time sure. Ryan you can jump in if you want but so basically the Miranda rights are you have the right to an attorney for questioning right so if they were to engage in interrogate in custodial interrogation that means somebody's in custody and getting interrogated they have a right to an attorney if they ask for one um and I can't remember when this happened so I can't remember if they were interrogating him after he asked for somebody um, but that would be the policy. If you are about to question somebody and they say, I want to talk to a lawyer, then you, you provide that before you question them. It's not just, I want a lawyer standing here while I'm being detained. That's, that's not something that's a covered under Miranda. Does that make sense? And people with better hands-on application of this law, feel free to jump in. <laughs> okay. I hope that helps. I'm glad you caught that, Carolyn. I honestly do not remember that. Okay. Sorry. Can I say something? Is it or is it out of turn? Okay. So it's. I just. I don't know. I've been talking about this a lot, so I'm, I've got some pent up energy here. But Alan brought up the thing about um, basically the the subjective belief of the officer being being the thing that got him out of out of trouble, kind of right. And this has come up. A few times, well, first I will say there used to be a constitutional rights policy that was very vague, but it basically said you will respect everybody's constitutional rights. It was really helpful for me because I didn't have to say like, specifically you violated this part of search and seizure. It was just, you know, the constitutional rights violation. However, I do appreciate that some specificity is more helpful for officers. I do understand that. I think that's overall a better system for people to know what they need to know not to violate, right? That was a side point, I apologize. <laughs> so one thing I've really been noticing is the policies do not have any kind of mental state requirement for breaking them. So, you know, in criminal law, you have you have reckless, you have negligent, you have willful, intentional, all those things. And we don't have any of that in policy. And so with things like career enders, like untruthfulness, I tend to sort of almost impute a willful just because it's a very big deal, but but basically, it's really I don't know why it's really come to my attention. Like it's really been more of a focus lately. But it's an interesting point for me that that that's not in there. It's just never in there. So I mean, Michael, that would be a crazy huge thing to have in in policy. But I don't know if it's something that needs to be looked at as more of like an administrative law issue that or how we adjudicate things issue. Um, because the policies are the policies and they're meant to be followed. It's not like we're going to write policies to decide how people break them, right? Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's something we can look at with how we adjudicate things. It's just something I've been thinking about when Alan said that I could not keep my mouth shut. So thank you for letting me talk. Okay, I think that I'm done. So my Yeah, so let's see, we're on. Um the policies practices and training so <clears throat> i'm not i'm going to try not to repeat things that other people have said and i want to thank bernadette and alan for the the lawyerly perspectives on this it was really helpful um uh i guess on so on the the search issue I, I share people's frustration at the same time that you know sometimes there are there are there are loopholes in, in policies and if, if if this is the way that um, the law or the policy or whatever is it law or policy that the, the good faith issue for law enforcement is that a, a legal thing or a Leah sorry the good 
say that again, Michael. Uh, the, the, the subjective. Um, so the uh, did not intentionally or willingly violate policy as, the act, as they acted on an observation of what um, they perceived right. to be was acting in good faith, right? So it, it's not in policy either. I mean, I think the standard for for administrative review or administrative investigation is more likely than not the person did the thing. It doesn't have anything about whether they did it intentionally or willfully. Does okay. that yeah. So, so the chain of commands um, uh, decision on this is, is 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 not sort of like there's not like a uh, implied footnote somewhere to something in writing. This. Okay. In that case, I find it really really frustrating. Um, it just isn't. It, it's. I, I, I'm a little flummoxed by it. Um, and as far as the body cam issue, I'm also, I'm also really flummoxed, you know, so I, I'm coming to the end of my third year on the CRB. And uh, I remember one of my first cases uh, that we, we reviewed was, uh, I, I remember Lindsay com uh, complaining about the body cam um, being, the body worn video being turned off. Uh, and, uh, and it's been a complaint, a regular complaint. And so this isn't something that, that EPD is not aware of. Um, it's like you said, you've had conversations with the chief and the chief has talked about possible changes to the policy. Um, it, it seems to me pretty clear that people are not, um, I mean, they, I have to assume at this point that, that officers know they can only turn the body worn camera off for for tactical reasons, and yet they're turning them off when for not tactical reasons. We, we've even had cases where the body worn video for some officers have been off and others were not, and so we were able to hear what. And it wasn't tactical, and so I, I don't. I I'm hesitant to to think of this as a training issue. I think that it has to be something that is just enforced. That's all I got. Thank you. Okay, that was everybody. Yes. Um, the final thing is adjudication recommendations. And again, um, chain of command said insufficient evidence. The chief said within policy, and the auditor said sustained. Is that that's correct? That's right. Right. Um, Bernadette. Um. Michael, I mean, he said it was for tactical reasons. That's why he muted. I mean, it's like, I, 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 I sorry, I just had to say something about that because it was like, it was so obvious that, you know, to just say beforehand, it's for tactical reasons. And then, you know, like nobody's going to have any questions about it. It's, it just seems disingenuous to just say that on the record, you know, for the officer before, you know, and, and to kind of almost point to the other officers. It's like, yeah, tactical reasons. Oh, yeah, yeah. Muting for tactical reasons. Like you're supposed to say that before you, you know, sign off on it. Um, you know, Alan, when you said there are learning points along the way, I mean, that really kind of is, you know, really what it this is about. I mean, it's learning for the community. It's learning for us. It's learning for the police. It's like it, everything is, you know, about learning. And, you know, I think there's the frustration that it's like there's, you know, groups that are just not you know, learning. They're not figuring out, um, you know, the, with regards to um, the, the muting issue, okay? But the muting issue is not one, you know, that we're looking at tonight um, because, you know, the, the issue that we're looking at tonight is the allegation of, you know, um, the search and seizure and of the, the, the the glove box um and you know i mean i i, I kind of went i i kind i never would say this was within policy i would never go that far um and i kind of was trying to figure out it's like well is it insufficient is it sustained i, I mean i appreciate leah your your you know well you know thought out memo um and it, it's it's a it's a hard one for me. I'm still kind of you know it's like do I have to say one way or the other, um, you know because it it's it I can I I can see the distinction between the sustained and the insufficient, 
Um, I, I guess that's kind of where I am right now. Um, if, if this was the officer with the longevity that had reached in there, I would say sustained. Um, and, and there shouldn't be a difference, right? There shouldn't be a difference between somebody who's newer and somebody who's been on the force longer. Um, so I guess that should be my answer, right? If the, if the person with longevity would be sustained, then the person without longevity should be sustained, right? So I, I guess that's where I'm coming down, but that's, that's there is a distinction in my mind um, based on the time of the experience on the force. Um, so that's a roundabout way of saying nothing. There you go. Uh, my take is that uh, other than the bewilderment for want of a better term of, of of something, a search being illegal, but the policy not being violated, which I'm wondering if that really, again, could ever really make sense in the world. Um, having said that, do I, I don't have any sense that the officers turned off their mics and said, hey, this is an illegal search, let's go open the glove box. That didn't happen here. I'm not, you know, there's no, I, I, I'm, I'm okay with how, you know, I, I understand the, sub the subjective belief, if the chief really believed the subjective belief that the officer felt, I mean, it, you know, it was a good search and it was, and it turns out it wasn't, um, I'm okay with the result. Thanks. It's my turn. Um, I, I agree with the auditor. I think it is sustained. Um, I do understand the, the, the nuance between insufficient evidence and sustained, but I think I would, I would fall on the sustained. Um, I do appreciate in the investigation how the officer, I don't remember which one now, I should have written it down. Um, one of them agreed that it was not a good search. I think it might've not been a, I think it was one, it was, it was the superior one. Yes, the one who had the longest. Yeah, they said that after talking to people and and I do appreciate how they said that they had talked to many people about it and before the investigation even happened and, and kind of kept questioning it. So I think that is a good um, cultural thing to have at EPD that if you make a call and even if it hasn't been investigated, but you think maybe that wasn't right to, to have that open dialogue with other people. So I do appreciate that. Um, and I think that since they agree, especially that it was not a good search and seizure, then that, that helps me help, uh, feel appropriate landing on sustained. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think I'm. I think I'm in a similar place. I. Th I just feel like this is such a such a strange one. Um, the, I I, re I really appreciate your memo, Leanne. I was probably um, I probably been been mostly persuaded by it, uh, so I'll I'll end with sustain. I have a question. Um, I, I, have, I have too many questions sometimes, I think. Leah, can you, can you, can you be, uh, can you, can you get a DUI if you get inside your car and you're drunk and in the morning you let, let, let's say you, you're, you're still drunk and um, the police wake you up in your car. See Ryan turn on his video too. <laughs> you want to answer that? Uh, actually, I will let him answer that. I'm happy to if you want. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you, you have to be able to prove that somebody was driving it at some point in time while they were intoxicated. So um, that scenario that you gave, if they just got in their car, no. Now, if uh, there was another scenario that played out where somebody said they were driving, uh, and there was a way for them to prove that they were driving, either through you know witness IDs or cameras or something to that effect and to boot they had they would have to prove that the person hadn't drank or taken any intoxicants or whatever it was that caused them to be intoxicated uh after they were done driving so do we know were the were the keys in the ignition in this car 
was that noted i don't remember seeing that uh I don't recall where the keys came from. Uh, it wasn't something I was paying really close attention to at the time. So I, I don't remember off the top of my head. I thought in some of the discussion, either the body cam or in the interview, it must have been the body cam. They were talking about how the car was running. Was that the lights were flashing throughout the body worn video? Right. It doesn't automatically mean the keys were in there because you could have had the flasher switch on. But one, one officer remarked that the reverse lights were on and then later i saw that it was just this pattern of lights that were were on yeah thanks alan i do remember that now you're correct yeah so it's at best inconclusive uh at, at least with, with that regard with, with regard to that fact um you know i i'm gonna say I'm, I'm gonna say sustained here um because uh uh, I, I guess we can't establish that this that this car was being driven by the by the by the the, the person, um, and um, I don't know. What was prob was pro am I correct in reading that probable cause was not established until after they approached the vehicle? Is that what's at issue here? It was a welfare check. That's something that we didn't mention. I'm sorry, I'm out of turn, but we didn't mention the whole time that this started as a welfare check and it really did not end as a well, you know, he was fine. And that was 30 seconds in. Sorry to interrupt, Jose. Sorry. No, thank you. I mean, the, the it's a welfare check. At the same time, the car is on a speed bump in the middle of a parking lot. It looks wonky. So yeah, welfare check. I don't know. It it. Uh, I agree with the uh, police auditor. Sustained. All right, that was everybody. I think um, I think we have a couple of things that we could we could bring to um, another body at this point. Um, I think there has been concern, at least with some of us that um that the chief that we don't agree with the chief in this i think everybody agreed with that that even if we agreed with uh within policy that we didn't agree with the the with there i think everybody said that we agree that it should be sustained except bernadette said um insufficient evidence is that accurate no because i said that based on the fact that you can have a subject I said the policy, there should never be a policy that if it, if it was illegal, it's it within policy, but, but that quirk exists. And so I accept what the chief did, even if I don't agree with it. So I accepted it. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, well, we could, we could bring this to the chief's attention that we, that we didn't um, agree with it, even if we accepted it. And that's something we could do officially as a board if we wanted to vote on doing so tonight. Um, and then another thing that has been brought up is voting on what to do with the, the muting. And we have a few options with that. We could either ask Michael to take it to police commission. We could write our own memo to the chief and or the police commission. So we do have some options about how we want our, um, our official, if we vote on it, our, our voice to be heard. Um, so I think, uh, Leah? I just, I wanted to point, just a, I guess, point of information is the automobile exception part of the policy has since been removed from the policy. The what part of what policy? The automobile exception. Because of case law, after this case, it was removed from the policy. It's no longer an exception. So what's the policy now? It doesn't have an auto, it has the other search and seizure exceptions that are still current case law, but it's effective. The automobile exception is removed from the policy. So this would have been within policy had it happened yesterday. So, no, it would be it would be outside of policy if it happened yesterday. Sorry, what I'm trying to say is the section of, of the search and seizure policy that allows for a warrantless search of a vehicle under at that time <laughs> case law which is the case law that I quoted in my memo, 
has since been removed and there is no longer an automobile exception to the search to, to the warrant requirement for a search. Does that make sense? Better sense? I'm getting some nods, some less so. Carolyn, we can talk later. It was okay, we'll talk later. I didn't mean to derail everybody. I just wanted to let you guys know that the policy was changed. Okay. So that would that would apply to talking about how the chief's opinion or chief's adjudication, yes. Okay, so does that make it so if we wanted to say something to the chief officially, it wouldn't make any sense because of the policy changing? I don't think that's necessarily true. I think let's see. I think it is valuable for him to know that this board did not overall agree with the adjudication and 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 or the policy. Um, I think that's valuable for him to know. I don't know what material change would occur because of that. Um, the policy is already gone. The the case is already closed. Um, but I, do, I mean, I always think it's helpful for him. I also know, you know, he's got two employees here who, who I think tell him what happened. And I'm also happy to do that. If you want to do it in a more formal way, that's fine too. I'm also happy to, to convey that in a, in a less formal way, I guess. Okay. But that's up to you. Sure. Um, okay. So I guess let's, let's talk about that first. Let's take a vote on do we need to like do first and second just to vote or? Okay. Do people want to take a vote on making this a more- To be clear. Yes. If you're voting on an actual action, you need to do a first and second. If you just are doing a, hey, is there energy around this? That can be jazz hands. Okay. So if we want to take a formal stance or formal memo to the chief about this, rather than having it um, communicated through Cindy, Ryan, and Leah, um, that's what we're voting for right now. Does that make sense? If people want to vote for that, do people want to vote for that? I, I do not see a need to do it in a formal way. Okay, then we can move on. Um, now, the next one is, do we want to make a formal memo or letter to the chief and or police commission about the muting Allen? Yeah, I would move that um, uh, either we direct or ask Michael to um, inform if we vote in favor of it, inform the police commission that the CRB is in favor of um, eliminating the exception for muting for tactical purposes um, or in a memo that just is direct and to, you know, not a huge resource user, you know, so that's the motion. Second. Okay, all in favor of making a formal of some sort. Once we vote for this, we can decide which which form we want to take. So if you're in favor of making a formal declaration about the unmuting, then this is when we're voting. Okay, I think that's that passes, yes. Three out three out of four. Okay, and then Bernadette, did you? Oh, there are five of us, right? Well, it's four out of five. How, how am I missing this? Who am I missing? I'm missing somebody. I think it's because we have all these other random people in here. Um, Alan. <laughs> okay. I'm, um, it's, it's not that I'm against it per se. I don't like voting for things that are too up in the air as to how we're going to do it. Um, I, I, am per, I, I would prefer this. So, th so that's where it was. Is I would just like it to have been more clear as to which which process um, we would be going with. So, so it's not that I'm against the whole idea of it, but I just I like to know the process first. I mean, technically, the the other one's already passed. But what you could do is offer a friendly amendment, and we could pretend it took place before the vote, and say the motion is one of the two choices, and then have two votes. I recognize that, but I don't like Robert's rules of order, so I'm not doing friendly amendments. I'm just going to go with the next stage, which is see what people say they're going to do. Okay, so now we have the two options of having Michael take it in a less formal way and then having a more formal um, memo sent to police commission and the chief. 
So do we vote separately on these or do we do options? I think we can just discuss how we want to have it done. Um, I mean, I, I'm perfectly fine with Michael doing it. Um, but if somebody wants to write a letter, I just would hope that it would circulate through everybody before we actually would send something like that. But whatever Michael wants to do. Um, so just to be um, uh, fully upfront and honest, if, if it's left to me, there's a 50-50 chance it'll happen a little wonky <laughs> because I'll probably look for like a way to, to word it that I think is, you know, can be heard in the moment. Uh, it may or may not be. There's like all kinds of, because it'll be informal, there'll, there'll be all kinds of uncertainty about it. Whereas as Bernadette stated, if we do a letter, everyone can be sure like what's in it. We can also do both. There's no reason that I can't, my can't take the form of letting the chief know that this is coming down the, down the pipeline. Yeah. Sorry, point of timing. Uh, police commission is going to meet on Thursday. So a letter would not make it into the packet for distribution before this Thursday's meeting. So perhaps if we're ending more in the both area, Michael could bring it up at the meeting this week. A letter could follow for their packet next month. I, I think it would also be interesting to see if in an informal manner that Michael presents it at the police commission, if there is any response from either any of the police commission members or the chief as, as the issue is raised. I, I think that would be interesting to, to hear either one or both of those things. Agreed. I, I think as, as I was speaking, I, I, it occurred to me that that might actually happen. That I might bring it up and then the chief will say, oh, actually we're on top of that and this is happening. And that might just take care of itself and then we don't have to do a letter. But, um, but I, I do think that the, the two pronged thing might, might make sense as a, as a plan to propose and vote on uh, because that way we can delegate people to write the letter. Um, they can come back to it next month and we're not um, caught up on the, the timing. Is that a, is that a vote on that proposal? Okay. I pro so propose. Can I second? I will second. Okay. So we're voting to do a, the two pronged approach where Mike will bring it up and then we'll follow up with a letter and we can follow up next month about how his, how Michael's um, statement was received. Yes. Letter yes. if necessary. Letter if necessary. Okay. So we're voting for that. Raise your hand if that is what you want to do or a thumbs up that is also appropriate and that was five people look at me counting like a like a grown-up um okay and I also forgive me for this this should have happened during the case review I do have notes from Clay that I would like to also share um since Clay wasn't able to be here is is, is that okay for me to do that now even though we've moved on okay um so Clay said on the case we were reviewing for what it's worth I agree with the findings and echo the concerns in Leah's letter it seems like there are a lot of internal disagreement on the adjudication here and that training on search and seizure related to vehicles would be a good recommendation for PPB, and I think that's EPD. Um, when I read the complaint, I thought I would also want to explore whether the officers were discourteous reviewing the videos. However, I found their behavior to be professional. So, and Clay said to send their regards to everybody. So thank you for letting me do that. Okay, auditor report. Well, this is when I'm reminded as to why I had the idea to put it in writing so we wouldn't take up time at the meeting going over my report. Um, in short, my report is my staff are amazing. I am very, very lucky to have such a good team. Uh, we are working through some stuff. As you can see from the timing issues in that case that you reviewed, it's very helpful for me to have staff now so I can avoid such timing issues in the future. Um, if you guys have any questions on the stuff that I sent you, feel free to ask them. But otherwise, I really, oh wait, oh yeah, sorry. There's one other thing I wanted to say and that is that I really appreciate the discussion tonight. I think this was an interesting case and sort of not our typical case. And you guys hit a lot of points that I needed to hear. And um, 
yeah, it's just, I, I really appreciate this group. I appreciate the respectfulness which, with which we can all disagree and offer feedback and receive feedback. So just thank you all. Ah, Jose. Sorry, quick question. Um, is there a chance that we will be meeting in person next month, given that the order is changing as of Friday? So there is a chance in that now that you mentioned it, there was something I was going to bring up tonight. <laughs> I got antsy about it being 740. Um, so council is exploring, my understanding is council is looking at meeting in person next month for their uh, council meeting. Um, I was sort of talking to other staff who support other boards and commissions about where they're landing with that. And um, the thought was to kind of see how how that in-person meeting goes as far as technology, because we are still required by law to have everything recorded and available to the public virtually. Um, and frankly, there's not a lot of city rooms that are set up for that to my knowledge. So I wanted to hear what people thought, but also my recommendation would be to see how April goes with um, making rooms available that have the sufficient technology needs, but keep April remote and then perhaps May or perhaps June come back in person. I say perhaps June because frankly, May, I'm going to be gone. I am going to miss this meeting. I will miss your lovely faces, but I'm taking a vacation. So finally, um, <laughs> but I have ideas for that. Um, Lindsay and Rob and I were talking about potential training topics and I'll, I'll, check, I'll check in with you all about what we do about May. But anyway, my recommendation would be to see what happens in April. Ryan, you raised your hand. Okay, go. I was letting you finish. Oh. I just wanted to share with you guys really quick. Uh, I, I heard Clay had had the training recommendations. And so I just want to share with you that this month at in-service, we actually have an hour on search and seizure as it relates to vehicles. Because that, as Leah mentioned earlier, there was really fresh new case law that came out right around the time of this event. So I don't know if that muddied some things up or how that worked, but it's it's clear that you know we've, we've removed that from our policy and we're also doing training on it this month. So just wanted to make people aware. I really thought you were weighing in on the in-person meeting issue, um, but thank you for saying that. So anyway, that's my recommendation on the in-person meeting. If you guys have questions about either of those things, please throw those out there right now. I think that's reasonable to do um, one more month virtual and see how it goes. And also if, just one-on-one, -on -one, if anyone has strong feelings either way, please email me just so I, I know. Um, I don't have to share those with everybody, but I would love to know the, the tenor of where you all stand on that. All right, so closing comments. Um, we'll do the same, just roundabout, and we'll start with Alan, if there are any things that you wanna say to close up. Alan just wants to say that he saw Rob move a few times so that in, I didn't ask him to validate that he was not in front of a green screen and move his hand through the pen. And I wanted to thank Cindy, Vicki, and Beatrice for uh, their participation and Sergeant Nelson for his and everyone else for a spirited meeting. Thank you. All right, in the chat, um, Beatrice reminded people that recruitment info will be emailed out shortly. Do please contact your circles because we will definitely have openings there, an opening at the very least. So it's good to get people involved. That's my, that's the only thing I have to say. Um, I have nothing to, to add. Thank you all. I just wanted to make a quick comment with regards to the the coaching. I think the difference between having the sustained is knowing that there will be some discussion with the officer to remedy the, that this doesn't happen again. And when something is not sustained, um, we have to trust that coaching is going to happen and have the same impact. And so I think having Michael Clues here tonight to talk about, you know, the stress that this puts on them, I can only hope that when someone is under a stressful situation and they find that it's like, okay, 
I didn't do everything right. Um, and it was insufficient. So I kind of dodged a bullet. They're going to take the training well, right? Um, as opposed to, shoo, I, you know, got out of that one. Um, and so I, 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 I appreciate that we always need to, you know, recognize the length of service and how it affects, you know, what, what happens after, after everything is wrapped up. Um, and that we hope, but we've seen here, I mean, there have been officers that we've seen that just get off probation and, you know, they have three allegations be, before us, you know, in a six month period. I don't, I, I, I hope that this is not going to be in a, a track record for the officer that we had before us today. Um, but I think that's always something that it's like in the back of my mind, I always kind of wrestle with that. It's like, what's the best way to make sure this officer recognizes you know, what was going on was not an okay thing to do. Same with the, the muting, you know, it's like when you've got a senior officer saying mute, a younger officer is going to obviously go along with it. So I think, you know, as part of that, getting the, you know, the more senior officers to stop muting is going to really help with the younger officers to stop muting. You know, even if the policy doesn't change, it's getting those people that, that have that, um, you know, mentor relationship, you know, regular, formally or informally with the younger officers, and by younger, I mean people with less time, um, to get them to, you know, always take the best approach, you know, always ask those extra questions, always document that extra thing, you know, the hood of the car was warm, the car was running, not just the lights were flashing, all of those little things that make it easier for IA to say, yes, you did the right thing, or here's how you could have done it better. Because the more documentation that they have when it gets to IA, the more they're going to be able to coach them in the moment of the conversation without it having to go to the coaching of the moment because you're, you're found in violation. So just like to say that. That's helpful to keep in mind. All right. Um... Even with some weird extra things we've thrown in, we're only we're adjourning three minutes late. So good job, team. Um, we will meet next month. And if you have feelings about where to meet and how to meet, reach out to Leah. Thanks everybody for being here. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night.